Hello all and welcome to this online presentation in which we'll discuss biases in controlled studies. So the four major biases that we'll focus on uh, in this slideshow is selection, performance, attrition and detection bias. So selection bias arises if the researchers manipulate the enrolment of participants in the trial in any fashion. That is, um, the, the process in which they're um, allocated to the intervention group or the control group is not randomised, um, or if patients self-select. Um, that is, they choose whether or not um, they receive the intervention or the control or comparison. Um, now, the obvious outcome is that we get an unrepresentative sample of the population. Um, which may affect the uh, external validity of the trial or the generalizability of, of the study. So for instance, um, if selection bias occurs and we uh, identify that um, the intervention group, for instance, um, is much younger, much healthier, let's say, than the comparison group, um, then obviously we're going to have this uh, issue of um, uh, the external validity of the trial being compromised. So how can selection bias be overcome? Well, the obvious um, method is randomization, if possible. Um, and there are a variety of ways in which you can randomize. Uh, simple randomization, so as a, a patient comes into the trial, uh, they have a 50-50 chance of being randomized to the intervention or control groups. Uh, it could be uh, more detailed, so we could be looking at uh, stratified randomization or even block randomization. Um, basically what we want to be looking for in, in terms of overcoming selection bias is a detailed description in terms of how participants were selected and allocated to the, to the two groups. So one way in which you can uh, quickly um, uh, form an opinion as to whether or not selection bias exists is to look at the uh, demographic or, or baseline characteristics of the study. So if the baseline or, or demographic details um, of the intervention and, uh, and the uh, control group are similar in terms of age, sex, other co comorbidities, uh, then we can be uh, assured that selection bias has been minimised. So allocation bias, um, I guess that's another form or another type of selection bias um, and that relates to how we actually go about allocating participants to groups. Um, so if that's compromised, um, it's, a, it's obviously a, a very big issue. Um, as I said in the previous slide, um, if, if we're randomising participants to one group or another, but if we, we, if we can manipulate it in some way, we, we are going to um, increase the chances of allocation bias. Uh, once again, being, being biased in the sense that we want to uh, have younger, healthier participants, let's say, in the intervention group, because we want to prove that our new drug is more beneficial than, uh, than the placebo or, or other treatments uh, would um, increase the chances of allocation bias occurring. So as previously mentioned, uh, studies with selection and allocation bias um, have uh, differences at baseline um, and can overestimate um, the estimates of the effectiveness of the actual treatment that we're uh, looking at. So how do we overcome this? Well. As mentioned, randomization and concealment of the randomization process. So another form of uh, blinding um, within the study itself. So the second bias that we're going to consider is performance bias. So sometimes it's also referred to as ascertainment bias. So if we think about a, a trial, the first step is to recruit the participants and allocate the participants to one group or another group. Um, and that's where selection bias comes into effect. The, the second process is once participants have been allocated, we want to actually implement the intervention or the comparison or control arm. Um, so this is where um, the issue of performance bias uh, can, uh, can occur um, and that's um, most commonly um, thought of if the patient can identify uh, whether or not they're uh, in the intervention group or the comparison group once the uh, actual treatment has commenced. So why is it important to overcome performance bias? Well. Hopefully, it protects uh, against patients in the control group uh, seeking other forms of care, um, and it, uh, it can identify patients in the experimental group who may experience a uh, placebo effect. Uh, 
So how do we overcome performance bias? So you've probably most commonly heard about a, a double-blinded randomized control trial. So in terms of the blinding, this is where the, the first blinding may occur. Um, and that is uh, where we blind both the participants and investigators if possible. Now, sometimes it's uh, possible to blind um, the, the participants. Um, usually, um, we can see that in, in drug trials where both the um, intervention pill and the control pill look the same, taste the same, um, all characteristics are, are similar and it's, and it's very difficult to differentiate between the two. Sometimes it is possible to uh, blind our uh, investigators or researchers, um, other times obviously in this um, example, uh, not so. So the following um, slide is, is just an example of um, where we still can blind um, if, if, if we can uh, get the actual study through uh, ethics. So this was a study in 2002 uh, that looked at um, the intervention being arthroscopic surgery uh, for the treatment of osteoarthritis of the knee and, and identifying whether um, uh, having surgery um, increased uh, a patient's mobility but also decreased their pain. So what the investigators did was recruit um, patients with osteoarthritis of the knee um, and they randomised them either to receive surgery, that is the um, arthroscopic uh, surgery itself, um, and in order to, to blind uh, the patients, um, they were able to get through ethics, um, what they called a sham surgery. So patients allocated to this uh, control arm um, also underwent surgery um, in the sense that they were put under anaesthetic, um, had incisions, um, were, were under, under general anaesthetic for um, however long the um, normal duration of the surgery was um, and then were um, sutured up and wheeled back into recovery. So simply looking at, at the knee, these control patients um, would have no idea or, 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 or no perception that they weren't actually in the intervention group. Like I said, um, it's it's something um, that was highly controversial. Um, from a, interestingly enough, um, if we look at the results uh, here, uh, we've got um, uh, before procedure in terms of uh, pain scores. Um, so if we look at the uh, the groups, uh, the placebo group being the uh, the black line um, and two forms or, or two different varieties of um, uh, arthroscopic surgery being performed. Um, no real differences uh, between the groups. Interestingly enough, um, whether we look at the two, six week, six month, or even a longer term two year outcome, again, we saw no differences in pain outcomes. So just a little bit of um, food for thought to consider when we're looking at treating um, patients with osteoarthritis of the knee. So the third bias that we'll discuss is attrition bias and this uh, notion called intention to treat analysis. So attrition bias, as the name suggests, um, identifies uh, whether or not patients uh, dropped out in the study. Um, and we can overcome this by identifying uh, if patients have dropped out, why they dropped out, um, uh, as well as performing an intention to treat analysis. So I'll take a, uh, a hypothetical example where we're doing a trial and we've got 400 women. Uh, in this case, we're looking at folic acid, um, where 200 women have been um, allocated uh, to the folic uh, acid group, so that being our intervention group, and uh, 200 women being allocated to the placebo group or the control group. So let's say we, we follow them up um, uh, during their pregnancies um, to identify um, how effective folic acid was in reducing the risk of uh, a neural tube defect. Um, and let's say uh, we look at our, our folic acid group first and we identify that of the 200 participants that were allocated to the group, um, 185 completed the study of which 8 had an uh, NNTD affected pregnancy. Likewise, in the control group, we identify that 187 patients out of the 200 uh, completed the study, of which 14 had an NTD. So if we simply calculate the relative risk from these uh, two groups, we get a uh, relative risk of uh, 0.6. So in this case, based on these results, uh, we would assume that um, 
uh, taking folic acid reduces the risk of an NTD effect of pregnancy by 40%. Now this is where um, attrition bias and intention to treat analysis comes into play. So if we look at the, um, the group that was allocated the folic acid, as mentioned we had 200 participants initially randomised to this. Um, however, of this only 185 completed the study. So there's two types of uh, intention to treat analysis that we can perform. One being the best case scenario, or one being the worst case scenario. So in this instance, let's perform the worst case scenario, and that is identify that these 15 patients that dropped out, the reason being that they dropped out was because they had an NTD effective pregnancy. So then if we include those 15 patients in our final outcome, uh, we get 23 patients um, with an NTD effective pregnancy. That is eight plus the 15 that dropped out. And similarly, across on the placebo side, we had 200 odd patients that were randomized to receive the placebo, um, of which 187 completed the trial, so 13 have dropped out. So in the same uh, vein, we will assume that all of these 13 patients also had an NTD effect of pregnancy, and so the outcome uh, increases up to 27. So now if we perform our intention to treat analysis according to the worst case scenario, we see that our relative risk is uh, ha has changed quite considerably. So the relative risk now is uh, 0.96, or, or only a 4% uh, benefit to um, taking folic acid. We could take uh, the opposite case in which we um, assume the best case scenario. So in the best case scenario, we take our 15 patients in the intervention group, and we say, or we're, we assume that they're fine. So rather than it being um, 8 out of 185 that have had a, an NTD effect of pregnancy, now it's 8 out of 200. And likewise on the um, placebo side, uh, we've had uh, 187 participants complete the study. Uh, we're going to assume the 13 that dropped out uh, were fine as well. So now if we ca uh, calculate our best case scenario uh, using the intention of treat analysis, um, so just... Um, our intervention over our control group, we get a relative risk of 0.56. So basically, I guess the thing to um, take out from intention to treat analysis is it just gives you a little bit of flexibility um, in interpreting the results um, when there's constrict. And finally, we are going to talk about uh, detection bias um, and that relates to measuring the outcome. So ideally um, in any type of study um, uh, outcome should be both patient as well as investigator reported. Um, the reason being that hopefully um, the outcomes are then reliable and valid um, and uh, in, in terms of patient reported outcomes we want to be identifying uh, their, their outcomes so from their perspective using validated tools um, but from an, uh, an investigator perspective, um, uh, we want to be identifying outcomes and reporting them uh, according to um, f uh, fixed scales or, or fixed uh, measures. So uh, something like blood pressure, uh, blood glucose levels, etc., etc., um, that can be measured through laboratory means, which um, in effect can't be manipulated. So detection bias is our last bias, and it's also known as assessment bias. Um, and, and again, we want to overcome uh, detection bias by uh, blinding our outcome assessor, that is the investigator measuring the, the outcome. So in this case, um, we'll take another example of um, patients with osteoarthritis of the knee. Um, and let's assume they've been taking the intervention, in this case, glucosamine. If a, uh, an investigator hasn't been blinded, um, and let's uh, assume in this example that the investigator knows that the patient has been taking glucosamine um, and believes that glucosamine is in fact beneficial, uh, they may manipulate the, uh, the outcome of the results, um, whether it be intentionally or unintentionally. So for instance, they could be asking the patient to report uh, the level of pain on a, on a scale of zero to 10, zero being no pain, uh, 10 being excruciating pain. Um, if the uh, examiner knows uh, which group the uh, patient's been um, allocated to, um, they may manipulate the results. So they must, may ask the patient, um, you know, how bad is your pain? And they may respond by saying, oh, look, it's a seven out of 10. Uh, 
uh, to which the uh, investigator may may unintentionally or intentionally say something along the lines of, "Well, oh, yeah, I would have thought that would have been a little bit lower by that stage, or I would have thought that your pain had reduced." So thereby, you know, um, whether it be intentionally or unintentionally, they're uh, manipulating the results. So again, how can detection bias be minimised? Um, ideally, by blinding um, the out outcome assessor. Uh, like I said, it's not always required. So something or measures in which um, uh, you're reporting something like mortality. Um, I guess there's no real need to um, blind um, the outcome assessor as it's fairly um, difficult to um, manipulate uh, that result. What we also want to identify is um, what data was collected. So was it patient reported? How was it reported? What tools were used? Well, you know, were there validated tools in terms of psychometric properties? Um, or were they sort of um, clinically uh, manipulated in any way? So the last um, uh, bias that we'll talk about is confounding. Um, and confounding is when another factor um, blurs the effect. So basically, um, uh, it's associated with the exposure um, and it's uh, affecting the outcome, but we can't see a direct link between exposure and outcome. So a couple of examples here. Um, we may have a question, is high blood pressure associated with heart disease? So one may assume that high blood pressure, yes, it is associated with heart disease, but a confounding factor may be obesity or, or BMI. Likewise, does uh, a high caffeine diet increase the risk of um, a heart attack? One might say caffeine, yes, you know, th there is a biological link you know, that, that, that it may increase the risk of um, uh, heart attacks. What we don't take in, in, into consideration is that um, some people, when they do have a coffee, also seem to have a, uh, a cigarette. So um, having a cigarette or, or the notion of these other confounding uh, variables may impact upon the final outcome of the uh, of the study.